The partnership for a secure society has upgraded refrigerator security protocols. Your lunch has been imprinted with your identification. Unauthorized match. Mitigating threat. Need a security boost? Check with the Partnership for a Secure Society's Consumable Connection Division for available upgrades today. Stay safe. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill O'Hearn, Vice President, Security Technology Operations, AT&T. All right, welcome back. I hope everybody enjoyed lunch and uh, hope you're taking advantage of all the uh, displays that we have outside. A um, lot of talk uh, this year about virtualization. I uh, hope you get a chance to stop by the, uh, the Astra demo, see uh, Michelle and Dan and, and the team there, some really good work going on. Uh, so I have the pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, our keynote. Uh, Dr. Gary McGraw is the Chief uh, Technology Officer of Sigital. Uh, Gary is uh, uh, a software security, con or Sigital is a software security firm with headquarters in Washington, D.C., uh, 13 offices throughout the world. He's globally recognized authority on software security and the author of eight best-selling books. Uh, he's also the editor of Addison Wesley Software Security Series. Uh, Dr. McGraw has also written over 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications, authors a monthly security column for search security, and is frequently quoted in the press. He serves as a strategic counselor for top business and IT executives and is on several advisory boards. His dual PhD is in cognitive science and computer science from Indiana University, where he serves on the Dean's Advisory Council for the School of Informatics. He also happens to be one of the top bartenders in New York. So let's welcome Gary. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gary McGraw, Chief Technology Officer, Sigital Inc. Hello. Hello. So I'm pleased to be here in the coveted after lunch speaking slot. I want to tell you today about software, about security, about software security, and about what we're doing to define and execute the future um, in security. I started in computer security about 1995 um, because this language called Java came out. Anybody ever heard of Java in here? So when Java came out, there were lots of claims about Java being secure, whatever that meant. And there were people who were saying things like, if you write anything in Java, it will be secure. And we wondered what that meant from a programming languages and platform perspective. And so Ed Felton, who's now at the White House, uh, and I, were, worked on this book called Java Security. We broke the Java security model a lot. And I was just a kid, it made me wonder why people who were super wizards building systems, like Bill Joy or Guy Steele, the people who designed and implemented Java, messed things up? And where would you go if you wanted to learn how not to mess things up? And that's where the idea for the book Building Secure Software came from. So I want to talk today about what's happened over the last 15 years in the field of software security and most importantly, why you should care. I listened to the keynotes this morning and I heard a lot of talk 
about making security more proactive, about getting in front of the problem, and about um, how the time frame for an attack is really compressed and it all happens very fast now. But what I believe is that the way to really get in front of computer security is to build stuff properly in the first place. And that's really what software security is about. So here's the problem. Software is everywhere. If you're in any business, your business involves software. It's in our power grid, it's in our cars, it's in our financial systems, in our communication systems. AT&T has an unbelievable pile of software, most of which works pretty well. And software is kind of eating the world. But the real problem is that most software just sort of kind of barely works. That's the sneaky secret of software. And I'm sure that many of you as security professionals know the problems that happen when you have to deal with software that doesn't even work, doesn't do what it's supposed to do in the first place. Now imagine trying to secure something that sort of barely works and you can see the problem. And in fact, if you think about the way computer security has gone since the very early days, the first idea was, well, we got a pile of broken stuff. Let's call it our internal network and all of our software applications on our LAN. And we have a bunch of very bad people out on the internet. And the first paradigm of computer security was, well, let's put a thing between the bad people and the broken stuff. Anybody know what that thing is called? A firewall, of course. So we put a firewall between the bad people and the broken stuff, and it protects the broken stuff from the bad people. But I just have a simple question for you all, although it is after lunch. Why is the stuff broken? Anybody ever thought of that? Like, don't you think it would be easier to protect stuff that's not broken? We can still use a thing. We can still put a firewall between the bad people and our not broken stuff, and it'll be much harder for people to attack our systems because if you look at the Achilles heel, if you look at the root cause of all of these security attacks that we've heard about this morning, ultimately it often boils down to a piece of software that was broken. And the question is, what can we do about that? One problem is, of course, that perimeter security isn't really working out so well. Like, imagine that you are in 1540, say, or maybe 1450, a long, long time ago, and the height of military technology in 1450 is you strap metal plates to your body so you can barely move, and then somebody hoists you up on a horse that can barely move, and they give you a stick and you're supposed to donk the other people that are also covered with metal off of their horse with your stick. <laughs> okay, everybody got that image in your mind? That's 1450. And in 1450, if you were gonna attack the neighbors, because that's as far as you could go in just a few miles on your horse before the horse just died, you go over to the neighbor's house and you go, oh no, water. Because if your body's covered with metal plates, water really kind of sucks. <laughs> that's a perimeter that's hard to get over, right? So in 1450, that was a super fantastic security mechanism when you were covered with metal plates. But what do we do now if we want to attack a castle like that? Well, we just light it up with a laser from space and we send in a predator drone and boom, it's gone because you know what, guys? That moat, it doesn't matter <laughs> to modern attackers. So here's a question. How much of your enterprise security is relying on a perimeter? That means you have to define a perimeter, and then you have to put the right mechanisms in the perimeter. And the problem is that the perimeter is busy disappearing. Anybody heard of cloud computing in here? <laughs> Everybody, of course, has heard of cloud computing. How about massively distributed programs? 
You know, things that we build that are modern pieces of software. If you think about the way the web is created now and about how an application is actually assembled in almost real time in your browser from parts that come from all over the place, the question is, where's the perimeter? And the answer is, the perimeter's disappearing. So we need to do something about that, change our paradigm. So one thing we might want to do to change our paradigm is use a bunch of cryptography. Like, if you go to developers and you say, hey, you guys, we need you to write secure software. Can you make it secure? The first thing a developer pile will do is they'll say, sure, we'll just sprinkle magic crypto fairy dust everywhere, all over it until it's shiny and sparkly. Because developers are taught to think about functions and features. And a really critical and obvious security feature is cryptography. Now, the problem is, of course, that cryptography is useful, but it's a thing. And security is not a thing. Heck, even Bruce Schneier, who wrote one of the most important books on applied cryptography, agrees with that point. So if we're going to build security into software because the perimeter is disappearing, but we can't use cryptography, what is it that we're going to do and how much of it should we do? That's what I want to answer in the rest of the talk. We all know by now that security is risk management, and we know that there's such a thing as too much security, just as much as there's not enough security. And the trick is to find just the right amount of security. When we talk about building security into a piece of software or into the design of our future systems, what we're trying to do is software risk management. We're trying to figure out how much analysis, how much security design, how much review, how much penetration testing we should do in all the software that we build. And so coming up with that risk management approach, which is what all of you all do as security executives every day, is, is, should be applied to software equally as it is to other aspects of computer security. So that's kind of the state of the world that we're in. We have software eating everything, and we have the old paradigm not working out as well as we would like it to work out. So what we have to do now is look at software security. And the first question to ask yourself is, who should do software security? Is it the developers? Is it the network security operations people? Who should do it? If you go to many enterprises today, not all enterprises, but many, you walk over to the security ops people over here and you say, hey, you guys, software security. You know, what are you doing about that? And they say, well, we bought a firewall thing and it says it protects the broken software, but really we know it doesn't really because, you know, we have to expose our applications on purpose. That's our business. And those darn developers over there keep building broken stuff. We hate them. You go, whoa, that's pretty radical. The security people hate the developers. That's not good. So you back away from them slowly so as not to show them your back. And you go over to the, this side of the house, to the developers, and you say, hey, you guys, software security. You know, are you working on that? Because the security people, and they say, the security people, we hate those guys. Well, why do you hate those guys? We hate those guys because we built a perfect new thing. It was all shiny and good. It worked in the test environment. And then it came time to ship it, and we tried to install it and there was this firewall and the ports were wrong and it couldn't even talk and it didn't work at all. And yeah, then they came and they took away our privileges. We can't even build software anymore because we're not root. We hate those security people. So these people are pointing over there saying the security people are supposed to do it because that's not our job, right? And the network People over here are saying the same thing. The developers are supposed to do it because, you know, it's software. And you know what we really hate is users. Users are terrible. And the worst kind of user in the entire universe is a user with a compiler. 
They're all over there. So we got a problem. Who's in the middle? Hint on slide in blue words. Who's in the middle? Nobody. So who gets software security done? Nobody. Who gets a bonus when software security goes well? No, not nobody, the CEO. The CEO always gets a bonus. I thought this was New York. All right, so in Management 101, if you want to get something done, what you do is you make it somebody's responsibility and you give them the authority to get it done and the budget to get it done. That group is called the Software Security Group. And we've been working with many, many companies all over the place that have software security groups. Sometimes they're called product security group. Sometimes they're called app application security group. That's fine. But there are people whose responsibility is thinking about software security and application security. And those are the people that are supposed to be in the middle. If you don't have a software security group in your company, you need to get one. You are seriously behind if you don't have one of those. If you're counting on the developers to do it, that will not work. If you're counting on some sort of pizza box that you strap into your pile, your you know, firewall pile to do it, I'm afraid that won't work either. So get a software security group. That's lesson number one. Now, the problem with software is that building software is complicated, and there are many different ways of building software. Let's name a few. There's Agile, there's Scrummy Scrum Scrum, there's, uh, let's see, Waterfall, there's Spiral, there's CMM level 5 million and 7 that has a lot of clipboards associated with it, and there's extremely bad programming. Those are all different methodologies. Oh yes, and there's also Tim's way. And really, if you go to the dev team and you go, Tim's way, you do Tim's way, who's Tim? Well, Tim's our leader and he always gets us a bonus, so we just do Tim's way. It involves goat sacrifice on Thursdays. And you know what? That's totally fine. The last thing we want to do as security people is try to change the development religion of the developers. Let them have their religion. That's totally cool. We shouldn't change religions. That's a bad idea. Right? So let the developers have their religion, whatever it is. It could be extremely bad programming. It could be CMM level 57. It could be Tim's way with the goats. But when they have their way of doing it, they're always going to be producing a set of artifacts. And those artifacts are shown up here on the screen. I mean, they're supposed to be producing those artifacts. Now, if you look at these little boxes, there's one that every single software program on Earth should have. What is that one? Code, very good. I was uh, just giving a talk at a much more academic audience and everybody's like, requirements. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like not in the real world, buddy. So code, I mean, everybody has code. There are a few government programs that don't have code yet, but they're gonna have code any minute now, right? So if you have code, you can do code review with a tool. I'm sure you've heard of static analysis by now, and I'm sure that you've heard of the idea of reviewing code automatically using one of these tools. There is a whole slew of these tools available. We help to invent them at Sigital, and we help to make them work in the real world every day now. I'll tell you this, if you're not using one of those tools to secure your code base, you're not looking for standard everyday bugs that everyone knows about, the lawyers are gonna one day ask you, so, you guys were using a code review tool, right? And the answer had better be, of course we were, not, what's a code review tool? Seriously. So that's the number one thing that you should do when it comes to software security. A lot of people think the number one thing is number three, penetration testing. But it's not, that's number three. Number one 
is code review. Everybody got that? Because code review happens way earlier in the life cycle. And even earlier than that in the life cycle is architectural risk analysis. Now, this can sometimes be a problem. We've had people call us up at Sigital and they say, wow, you guys do architecture risk analysis, right? And we say, yes, we do. They say, well, how much does it cost? And we say, well, it sort of depends on what you're building. Are you building a whole car? Yes, we are. Well, do you have your architecture written down? Uh, well, yeah, we were gonna write it down. So we often go, Doo -doo -doo -doo. the number you have called is no longer, no, we don't do that. What we say is, look, if you don't have an architecture written down, you can't have an architecture analysis. So the number one job is to write that down. And in fact, a long time ago in a security review, I got called in to do an architecture analysis, and we talked to the person who devised the architecture, his name was Manmeet, and we said, Manmeet, have you written any of this down? And he said, no. And we said, well, here's your security analysis. Manmeet killed by bus, game over for company. And the CEO overheard that, he was like, Manmeet, you can't go home for a few days because we had to extract out of his head how things worked, and then we had to think about it from a security perspective. So, two things that you must do in software security, the top two things are code review with a tool and risk analysis. Now, thing number three has got all the sex appeal, all the penetration testing stuff, and penetration testing should be done, but it shouldn't be the first thing that you do. Sometimes it can help you figure out how bad things are, but let me tell you how penetration testing often works in the real world. Okay, here's, here's how it goes. You hire some reformed hackers, and you know they're reformed because they told you they're reformed. And you give them a week to take a look at your stuff, and you say, here's a week, we'll give you $10,000. Oh, never mind, we'll give you $8,000. Actually, the price has gone down, we'll give you $7,000. Penetration testing is getting cheaper and cheaper. That's good news for all of us, but it's a commodity, right? So you give them 7K and a week, and they find five problems in the application that you had them look at. They tell you about four of them, and you take a look at those four, and you go, oh, I don't even get that one. Okay, this one we can fix, so you fix that one, and this one we can sort of kind of halfway fix, so you halfway fix that one, and well, then you ran out of time. So how many are left? Three. <laughs> the one you don't know about, the other two, oh, maybe it's seven. And the other four that got introduced with the fixes. Right, so, but the real problem, if you think about it as a grown-up, with penetration testing is it happens at the very end of the life cycle. And if you hire some people to break your stuff and they break it at the end of the life cycle, is it expensive or cheap to fix it? Expensive. In fact, that's the most expensive time to fix software. The cheapest time to fix security problems is when you're just having an idea. You go, oh, I think we'll do this. And somebody says, that's bad from a security perspective and you change your mind. That's like super cheap. So that's the time to really fix problems. And then comes architecture, and then comes code, and then comes the whole thing, and you know, then we can do some pen testing. Everybody clear on that? So number one, what is it? Code review. Number two, architectural risk analysis. Number three, penetration testing. Now let me tell you some bad news about security. The problem is that we all would love to have a security meter. We would love to have a special box that you put a piece of software in, and if it lights up green, the software is secure. Bing, 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 and you ship it. Wouldn't that be cool? Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a security meter. There's only such a thing as a badnessometer. Let me explain to you how that works. So we take a really smart hacker, say we take, I don't know, Moxie Marlin Spike, and we take his brain and we like smoosh it all down into a can and we get a hundred can test from Moxie. So we got Moxie in a jar. And then we take that set of canned black box tests that don't know anything about software 
and we run them against program A, and they break program A. So a canned set of tests breaks program A. What do we know about program A? Is it good or bad? You can say it, bad, it's bad. In fact, there's a technical term for how bad it is. You know what that is? It sucks. So if can tests break your program, your program is so bad that it sucks, that's not good. That's a security problem, and the badnessometer, which is cheap, found that security problem. That's pretty fantastic. Now imagine that you use the same can of tests against program B, and they don't find any problems. What do you know about program B? Not much. We ran some tests, they didn't find anything. Does that mean it's secure? No, that means our can is not so strong, <laughs> right? So you see, that's a badnessometer. It goes all the way from the can broke the code, your code sucks, and you're in deep trouble, all the way to the can didn't break the code, so, heh. Now, unfortunately, there are some software security vendors who would like to pretend that there's such a thing as a security meter. Those people are either bamboozling liars or really bad computer scientists. Take your pick. Or maybe they're both. <laughs> but we need to use badnessometers and they're cheap and they're important and we should do that just like we should do penetration testing. But what we must not do is treat it as a security meter. Everybody understand that? Super, super important. So, here's the other problem in software security. Imagine that we do some code review. Imagine we do some penetration testing and we find a bunch of problems. If we don't fix the problems that we find, we haven't done anything to solve the security issue. So fix the dang software is super important here. Everybody clear on that? There are a lot of people that are arguing out there in technical land about black box is better than white box is better than RASP is better than IAS, SAS, DAS, Gartner's got little acronyms coming all every day, whole new ones. And you know, and, and there are arguments over which one's best. You know the answer? Who cares? <laughs> if you find problems, no matter how you find them, you just have to fix them. So the best method would be the one that allows you to figure out exactly where the problem is and exactly how you ought to fix it. Now, we've been focusing on early problems in the early days, so we look at things like bugs. There's lots of bugs, and there's a whole parade of bugs that's been going on, and we have sort of bug of the day myopia. Let's name a bug, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, those are two big bugs. Buffer overflow, that's a bug. There's lots and lots of bugs. And we can find those things automatically, often, with a static analysis tool, doing that code review stuff I was talking about before. Unfortunately, bugs account for about half of the problem. Now, if bugs are half the problem when it comes to defects, what's the other half of the problem, do you suppose? turns out that the other half of the problem is design issues. And when you go to your software people, there are gonna be some architects there. Those architects are always problematic people, but they're really useful, you have to have them. Put two of them in a room at once and they have a big fight, that's kind of entertaining. Those architects understand that design is critical for software and design is also critical for security. Recently, got a bunch of uh, architects together, security architects and software architects from a bunch of different firms. One of the people there was Neil Daswani, who's now at LifeLock, hi Neil. And we built this thing called the IEEE Center for Secure Design. The idea was everybody had to bring some real design flaws from their practice, Neil was at Twitter at the time, and dump them out on the ground in front of everybody else, and we would just pile them up, and we would talk about security flaws, not bugs, and more importantly, how to avoid those security flaws. So we published a little paper 
which you can get for free under the Creative Commons. It's the first thing the IEEE has ever published under the Creative Commons, and hopefully not the last. So if you have some architects and you're concerned about secure design, get the secure design, um, Center for Secure Design Deliverable, and check it out. And address that other half of the problem. It's not just about bugs, it's also about design. So we've gotten the basics. We know the top three things we should do in software security, code review, architecture analysis, penetration testing. We know that software is a problem and the software security group has to solve that problem. And now what I want to talk about is a science experiment that I've been doing called the BSIM. The BSIM is a measurement stick for software security initiatives. So let's talk about what that means. Well, it's kind of silly to try to secure each piece of software one at a time, especially when you have 2,000 pieces of software that you've built in your own enterprise. So what you really need to do is integrate those best practices I was talking about before, code review, architecture analysis, and penetration testing, and so on, into the software development lifecycle. That is what a software security initiative is about. Many, many firms have these things going on. One of the most famous ones is, you know, Microsoft's Trustworthy Computing Initiative stuff, which came up with the SDL. It was a way of teaching 30,000 developers how to do things right. We've made a lot of progress in that. And the BSIM is about describing what many different firms over 100 now, do to build software in a secure fashion. We accidentally created a community of like-minded people who get together. We're getting ready to have a conference in uh, Denver in November, and it will be software security group leaders talking to other software security group leaders, which is very, very cool, and sharing best practices. The other cool thing about the BSIM, though, if you go to that URL, you can download it for free. It's also put out under the Creative Commons. So all that information from all these companies is free. Gosh, I don't see a TNT on there, Ed. Huh. Shoot, no Death Star. <laughs> the BSIM describes the work of all of these software companies and more. You know, this is from BSIM 5. You can see that there are just a few small banks like Wells Fargo and Bank of America. There are just a few software houses like Microsoft and PayPal and VMware. There's some cloud people up there. There's all sorts of stuff. And in fact, with the new BSIM, BSIM 6, which we're going to announce in a couple of weeks, we've already got the thing done, but now we're polishing it all up, we're going to describe the work of 78 companies 10 of which are healthcare companies. And that's very interesting because what we see is that financial services firms and independent software vendors are pretty darn good at software security. And they have a lot of lessons that we can all draw from them. Healthcare, on the other hand, they got a ways to go. The good news is we know what they should be doing and we know which direction they should go in because of the BSIM. <clears throat> we already established there's no such thing as a security meter, and so what we want to do is think about constructing and then measuring a software security initiative that teaches all of the developers and all of the architects and all of the QA people what they ought to be doing when it comes to software security. And when you do this, you can actually compare a firm on this little spider graph against everybody else on planet Earth. So there are 12 little sp spokes on that spider diagram, which correspond to 12 major practices. You can see code review up there, and you can see architecture analysis up there, and penetration testing too. But there are others, like training, compliance and policy concerns, how you do metrics and measure these things. I mean, it's a pretty geeky little tool we've got here. It actually describes 112 activities, and you can use it to show where you stand relative to your peers. If your job is to talk to the board, as we were discussing early this morning at the first keynote, if your job is to go 
figure out how to get the board to understand how to build security in. The BSIM measurement is incredibly powerful. Like, imagine that you're a bank and you get a BSIM measurement. We've measured 40 other banks. We can compare you against 40 of your closest competitors, I mean peers. And if you turn out to be the slowest zebra, that's sort of not so good, but it's really helpful at the board meeting because you can say, hey, look, we're the slowest zebra. And the board says, uh, yeah, is that bad? Because this is the kind of questions that the board asks. And you say, yes, sir, the slowest zebra often gets killed by the lions. That's bad. And they say, well, we don't want to be the slowest zebra. And you say, that's good. And they say, well, what should we do to speed up as a zebra? And you say, I'm glad you asked. And you pull out the plan that you've already got formulated for doing software security. And you say, there's the plan. Now let's make it happen. Because you can measure an initiative with the BSIM, you can carry out that sort of conversation. You can see three of the verticals that we covered in BSIM 5. We've added healthcare to the next version. We can get even geekier. If you thought it was bad already, wait till you hear about the 112 activities that we've described. So inside of those 12 practices, there are a number of different activities. If you count the little boxes, it's four by three here, you can see that each practice has a bunch of activities in it, and you can consider particular activities. For example, you see that thing right there under SSDL touch points at the bottom that says, ST1.3 in yellow, and it says 55 firms do that. That's one activity that 55 firms do. Here it is. Drive tests with security requirements and security features. Huh. So 55 firms do that. And you can ask yourself, do I do that? And you know what? The BSIM doesn't tell you what you ought to do. What it tells you is what everybody else is doing. And you can decide for yourself whether that makes sense in your organization. But the cool thing is, each activity is described in great detail in the BSIM. In fact, the BSIM is a guide for doing software security in a real organization that's built out of data from 100 real organizations. And that's really cool. And you can use it to show progress over time, too. Measurement is extremely helpful. Check out these numbers. This is one of my favorite slides. Remember I talked about the SSG, or the Software Security Group? You see that row that says SSG members? Under BSIM 5, it says 976. And the pre-BSIM release, 1379, that's 1,379 people working full-time in software security groups, and they are actually cooperating with these people in the satellite that are people not in the software security group that do software security stuff in other product groups or elsewhere in the company, but they do software security full-time. Now, you add those two up, you get about 4,000 people, right? And those 4,000 people are trying to control the work of 363,925 developers. See that number? Wow. So we're not talking about two guys and a dog. And we're not talking about theory. We're talking about real activities carried out by more than a quarter million people to do software security. Now, get. I, I'm going to admit this, they could all be collectively on crack. They could. They could. They could be like a whole bunch of lemmings running off the cliff. And you could just say, wow, I'm just going to use the BSIM to make sure I don't do any of that crap. That's fine. You can use it that way if you want. But what we have is a set of facts. And facts are so helpful in security. Because one of the things that's missing in our field it's facts. So if we have a pile of facts about software security, we can actually consult it from time to time. We can say, wow, that vendor told me that goat sacrifice is essential for software security, but I don't have any goats. Do I need to get some goats from the South American branch? <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. 
I take that back. Do I need to get some goats? Well, you know what? Let's look at the BSIM. Oh, wow, of the 112 activities, zero of them involve goat sacrifice. So that vendor is probably making stuff up. Now, if you're a CSO, it's really helpful to know which security vendors are making stuff up. And the answer is not all of them. The answer is just most of them. So we got to figure out which ones are not making stuff up. And the BSIM can help you with that. In fact, the BSIM is a wealth of information. If you have somebody running your software security group, they need the BSIM. And if you're doing software security or application security and you have a group for that, you should get a BSIM measurement and compare your software security belly button with everybody else's that's in the project. We started this out with nine companies a long time ago in 2008. I guess that was seven years ago. And I built it for nine companies and then I did 30 for BSIM2 and it was looking cool because after 30, we're like, whoa, we got enough data, we can do some statistics and stuff. It's kind of like science. So it was my science project that had sort of escaped the lab. And my CEO called me in one day, his name is John, and John said, well, McGraw, I really like the BSIM, it's cool stuff, I like the science that you're doing, the fact that we can measure people doing software security, that's fantastic. Um, how big do you suppose the BSIM's gonna get? And I said, well, I don't know, I wanna be as big as possible. The more data we have, the better it is because it's about data and we describe data. So the more, the merrier. Maybe we'll get to 100, which is where we are now. <laughs> and he said, that's great. Do you know how much you've spent on the BSIM? And I said, no, I'm a science guy. And he goes, well, I do. <laughs> Why don't you figure out a way to pay for this? So we do the BSIM now as a sort of a nonprofit scientific endeavor. And we ask people to help us by paying for a measurement and getting into the community. But the idea is we all share data with each other and we publish that thing under the Creative Commons so that we can come up with a measurement stick for software security. That is the basics of software security stuff. Um, it's been my pleasure to be here and share some of that with you. There are some resources that you might find useful that are also free besides the BSIM. So all this free stuff to download, you can download the IEEE Center for Secure Design thing. You can download the BSIM. Those are both under the Creative Commons. I have a podcast series called Silver Bullet. Ed's been on Silver Bullet. We need to do it again. Yes. Uh, and it's me interviewing mostly my friends and associates doing uh, security stuff. That has about 10,000 listeners a month. Um, and then I write a column for search security. The current column you might find useful if during this talk you were going, now wait a minute, you know, last time I brought up software security or application security in committee, everybody was like, we don't have to do that. We've got perimeter security stuff handling that. Or we don't have to do that. All we need to do is use cryptography. Or there's no reason to do that. You know what? There are seven myths of software security that I just wrote down and it just got published two days ago in Search Security. Read that if you need to get started in software security and you're getting some objections from people who don't know what they're talking about, use it as uh, the stick while you're wearing your metal body, <laughs> metal on your horse, right? And please consider joining the BSIM community. Thanks very much. You wanna do a couple questions? Sure, we'll questions. We have time for a couple questions if we want. So come on up to the mics, please. Don't be shy. Look, it's like a game show. The price is right. The price is free. Come on up to the mics, please. Anybody? Yeah. Can I put the last slide? Maybe. No. Hey, you guys, can you put the la last slide? Oh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> It's those people up there that are in control. Please, somebody ask a question. It'll be very helpful. Neil, for goodness sake, ask a question. All right, Ed's gonna ask a question. Thank goodness, that was embarrassing. 
It wasn't that good of a talk. So B B Sim looks really good. Uh, Thank you. Um, how, how does that deal with outsourcing, third party, oh, yes. offshoring, and so on? Fantastic question. Many of us have as much software that comes from vendors as we've built ourselves. In fact, some of us have more software built from vendors than we have ourselves. We're actually using a miniature version of the BSIM called BSIM for Vendors, which allows uh, an organization like yours, who has thousands of vendors, to separate the vendors who know something from the vendors who don't know anything. For example, you can say to your vendor, do you do code review? And they, if they go, huh? You put them in that pile over there. And if they say yes, you say, well, how do you do it? Well, we just have a smart guy. You put them in that pile over there. If they say yes, you say, how do you do it? They say, well, we use the Fortify static analysis tool from HP. Aha, you go in that pile. And you can separate them out. Now, this is important because a lot of people are doing vendor control by doing penetration testing on every single piece of product that you get from somebody, which is untenable. Plus, they changed it yesterday. Plus, it always changes. So it's important not just to penetration test the vendor code that you're using and counting on, but also find out how they produced it and whether they have a software security initiative of their own. Very, very good question. We're making lots of progress there with uh, a bunch of financial services organizations. There's time for one more question, but there's zero people up here. Shall we just be done? Oh, Neil, come on, run, run. Da, 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 da. How's that go? Could you categorize BSIM as a uh, white box versus black box and talk about the pros and cons there? Ah, yeah. So black box measurements are measurements that, you know, you can look at things like uh, how many break-ins you had or how many data center breaches there were or things like that, measurements from outside, maybe some penetration testing that didn't find any problems. That's black box. That's what you get when you don't look inside the organization to see what an organization's doing. The BSIM is a measurement that gets inside of your software organization and figures out what those people are doing to make security happen. White box things are useful and so are black box things. You have to use them both. Um, I think that it's a little bit easier to get a super cool, great looking black box rating and not really know what's going on inside. And then sometimes when you do a white box thing, you go, ooh. <laughs> Ugh. So do both and be forewarned. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent.